<laughs> when we first looked at the results, it was astonishing. People have left behind countless artifacts, offering us glimpses into ancient cultures and lost civilizations. But some discoveries don't fit the conventional story. These out-of-place artifacts raise intriguing questions about lost cultures, forgotten technologies, and cross-cultural contact that may have occurred long before we thought possible. Considering how big and magnificent the sculpture is, it must have been really important to the Shu people. Take, for example, the Jade Sword found in Georgia, USA. Its intricate Chinese carvings suggest a link to ancient China, thousands of miles away. Or the Sabu Dis from Egypt, a mysterious object that some believe might be an ancient technology or even a flying machine. These strange artifacts spark curiosity and raise questions about our past. Join us as we discover some unexplained out-of-space ancient artifacts. Chinese Votive Sword The Chinese Votive Sword is a remarkable artifact that was found in the vicinity of Atlanta, Georgia in July 2014. The sword, which was discovered partially exposed by a stream and tangled in roots by an amateur surface collector, indicated that it had been buried for a considerable period of time. Measuring nearly 30 centimeters in length and weighing about half a kilogram, the sword is crafted from lizardite, a mineral not commonly associated with artifacts found in North America. Its intricate carvings and motifs reflect the advanced craftsmanship characteristic of ancient Chinese artisans. The sword's design features significant cultural symbols, including a dragon and a silkworm, which indicate its origins can be traced back to the Qin Dynasty, approximately 2,000 years ago. The dragon is often associated with power and strength in Chinese culture, while the silkworm symbolizes prosperity and the importance of silk production. These elements suggest that the sword was not merely a decorative item, but rather held cultural and possibly religious significance. Scholarly discussion about the ramifications of pre-Columbian contact between Asia and the Americas has been sparked by the votive sword's discovery in Georgia. This artifact adds to a growing list of seemingly out-of-place Chinese items found in North America suggesting that extensive intercontinental trade routes may have existed long before European exploration. The presence of such an artifact raises questions about how it arrived in North America and what it signifies about ancient cultural exchanges. One theory posits that the sword could have been part of a larger trade network connecting ancient civilizations across continents. Historical accounts suggest that trade routes existed between China and various regions, including Southeast Asia and possibly beyond. If these routes extended to the Americas, it would indicate a level of maritime capability and navigational knowledge that challenges conventional historical narratives. In spite of these fascinating possibilities, the precise circumstances of the sword's arrival in North America are still unknown. Researchers are eager to investigate further to determine how such an artifact could have made its way from ancient China to Georgia. The lack of additional context or associated artifacts complicates efforts to establish a definitive historical narrative. Some skeptics suggest alternative explanations for the presence of the votive sword in Georgia. One possibility is that it could have been brought to North America by individuals who traveled across the Pacific Ocean long before Columbus's voyages. This theory aligns with claims made by some historians that Chinese explorers may have reached the Americas during earlier periods. However, definitive evidence supporting these claims remains scarce. The material composition of the sword also raises questions about its authenticity as an ancient artifact. Lizardite is not commonly found in American archaeological contexts, leading some scholars to speculate on its origins. Future testing may help clarify whether the mineral was sourced from deposits in either hemisphere or if it was transported across vast distances. In addition to its physical characteristics, the votive sword's design invites speculation about its intended use. Some researchers propose that it may have served as a ceremonial object or a votive offering, a physical representation of a religious vow or desire. 
Votive swords were often used in rituals to invoke protection or favor from deities, indicating that this artifact may have played a role in ancient spiritual practices. As interest in this artifact continues to grow, researchers are hopeful that further analysis will yield valuable insights into its origins and significance. The Sabu disk and other similar artifacts serve as reminders of how archaeological discoveries can reshape our understanding of ancient cultures and their interconnectedness. Before we dive deeper, let's take a moment to consider an intriguing artifact that has recently gone viral. This impressive object boasts a striking appearance, captivating viewers worldwide. However, its authenticity remains unverified. Could it be genuine, or is it merely a clever fabrication? What are your thoughts on this fascinating find? The Sabu Disk The Sabu Disk, an intriguing artifact from ancient Egypt, was discovered in January 1936 by archaeologist Walter Emery in the Saqqara Necropolis. Dating back to around 3000 BC during Egypt's first dynasty, the disk is named after General Sabu, whose grave it was found in. This unique item measures 61 centimeters in diameter and stands over 10 centimeters high, crafted from schist, a metamorphic rock known for its layered structure. The disk features a distinctive bowl shape with three lobes and a central socket hole which has led to various interpretations regarding its purpose. The intended function of the Sabu disk has sparked considerable debate among scholars and enthusiasts alike. Some researchers propose that it may have served as a decorative stand or even as a ritual lamp capable of holding oil. The three lobes give it a unique appearance, reminiscent of a lotus flower or a stylized representation of some other form. This aesthetic quality has led some to speculate that it was primarily an ornamental object, rather than one designed for practical applications. However, alternative theories have emerged that suggest the Sabu disc could represent an early mechanical device or even an aerodynamic flying disc. Some proponents of these theories argue that its shape and design indicate a sophisticated understanding of aerodynamics and mechanics that predates known technological advancements by millennia. This perspective posits that ancient Egyptians may have possessed knowledge and capabilities that modern scholars have yet to fully appreciate. One particularly interesting hypothesis is that the Sabu disk was used in the brewing process, specifically as a mash rake for mixing grains and water in large mash tuns. This theory aligns with the importance of beer in ancient Egyptian society, where it was considered a staple food item alongside bread. The presence of other food-related artifacts in Sabu's burial chamber supports this idea, suggesting that the disc may have played a role in preparing provisions for the afterlife. Despite these varied interpretations, mainstream scholarship tends to lean towards viewing the Sabu disc as an ornamental object rather than one with practical applications. The British Museum, which houses many artifacts from ancient Egypt, has not classified the disc as an optical or mechanical device, but rather as a unique piece reflecting the artistic sensibilities of its time. The fragility of the schist material also raises questions about its practicality. Schist is known for being brittle and challenging to work with, thus creating an object like the Sabu disc would have required exceptional skill and precision. Restoration efforts following its discovery involved painstakingly piecing together fragments of the disc, highlighting the challenges associated with preserving such delicate artifacts. Another aspect worth considering is the context in which the Sabu disc was found. Located within Mastaba S3111, alongside various artifacts intended for use in the afterlife, the disc's placement suggests it held significant value to General Sabu. Its unique design sets it apart from other stone vessels from the same period, indicating that it may have been crafted specifically for him as a symbol of status or importance. Theories about ancient Egyptian technology often intersect with fringe ideas about lost civilizations and advanced technologies. Some enthusiasts speculate that artifacts like the Sabu disk point to a forgotten era of technological prowess that modern archaeology has yet to uncover fully. While these claims can be controversial and are often met with skepticism from mainstream scholars, they contribute to ongoing discussions about what ancient cultures may have achieved. The Nimrud Lens 
During his excavations at the ancient Assyrian palace of Nimrud in present-day Iraq in 1850, Sir Austin Henry Laird discovered the fascinating Nimrud lens, also referred to as the Laird lens. This piece of rock crystal, dating back to the 8th century BC, measures approximately 38 millimeters in diameter and is slightly oval in shape. Its discovery has sparked considerable debate among historians and scientists regarding its potential functions and implications for ancient technology. Initially, the Nimrud lens was thought to be a simple piece of decorative glass. However, its optical properties suggest it may have been intentionally crafted for practical use. The lens has a focal length of about 12 centimeters, which would make it equivalent to a three-time magnifying glass. This characteristic has led some researchers to propose that it could be one of the oldest known telescopic devices, predating the first documented telescope by over two millennia. The exact function of the Nimrud lens remains speculative. Some theories suggest it might have served as a magnifying glass or a burning glass used to start fires by concentrating sunlight. Historical references indicate that similar lenses were known in the ancient world for igniting fires. For instance, Aristophanes mentioned the beautiful transparent stone with which they light fires in his play The Clouds. Additionally, Pliny the Elder described how glass balls filled with water could set clothes ablaze when aligned with the sun. Despite these historical precedents, there is no concrete evidence supporting that the Nimrud lens was used for magnification or fire starting. The British Museum, which currently houses the lens, maintains that there is no definitive proof of its use as an optical instrument. Curators suggest that its optical properties might be accidental and propose that it may have served as a decorative inlay rather than a functional tool. This perspective casts doubt on the more adventurous claims regarding its use in ancient astronomy or as part of a telescope. Italian scientist Giovanni Pettinato has been one of the most vocal proponents of the idea that the lens was used as part of a telescope. He argues that this could explain the Assyrians' advanced knowledge of astronomy, particularly their understanding of celestial bodies like Saturn. Petinato notes that Assyrians depicted Saturn as a god surrounded by serpents, which he interprets as their interpretation of Saturn's rings seen through a primitive telescope. However, many experts in Assyrian archaeology remain unconvinced, arguing that the optical quality of the Nimrud lens is insufficient for such purposes. The lens's surface features 12 cavities created during grinding which may have contained naphtha or other fluids trapped within the raw crystal. This detail suggests a level of craftsmanship and intentional design that aligns with other intricate Assyrian artifacts known for their detailed engravings and artistry. Laird himself noted small inscriptions on Assyrian artifacts that he suspected required magnification for their creation. There is still doubt about whether the Nimrud lens was a functional optical device or just a decorative item despite its possible importance. Many researchers have come to the conclusion that it may have been used primarily for decorative purposes, possibly embedded in furniture or other objects, because there is insufficient evidence to support its practical use. The Nimrud lens stands out not only for its craftsmanship, but also for what it represents about ancient technological capabilities. If indeed it was used as an optical device, it would challenge conventional understandings of when and how early civilizations utilized lenses for practical applications. Although there is still much discussion and interest in the Nimrud lens, its actual function is still unclear. Whether viewed as an early optical instrument or simply an exquisite decorative artifact, its discovery has undeniably enriched our understanding of Assyrian culture and craftsmanship. This mysterious artifact serves as a reminder of how artifacts can alter our understanding of ancient technologies and their historical applications, even as research into it continues. The mystery surrounding the Nimrud lens ensures that it will remain a topic of intrigue for scholars and enthusiasts alike for years to come. Bonus! Antikythera Mechanism The Antikythera Mechanism is an extraordinary ancient Greek device, often regarded as the first analog computer. Dating back to approximately 150 BC, it was discovered in 1901 from a shipwreck off the coast of Antikythera a small island between Crete and the Peloponnese, 
This remarkable artifact has fundamentally changed our understanding of ancient technological sophistication and astronomical knowledge. The Antikythera mechanism was found among the remains of a trading ship that sank in the first half of the first century, BC. The shipwreck contained various artifacts including coins that helped date the wreck to between 70 and 60 BC. The mechanism itself is believed to have been constructed around 100 BC, though some estimates range from 150 to 87 BC. Its design is attributed to Hellenistic scientists, possibly linked to the schools of thought influenced by Archimedes and other prominent figures of that era. The device is composed of at least 30 gear wheels and was housed in a wooden case about the size of a shoebox. It features several dials on its face which were used to predict astronomical positions and eclipses, as well as to track the cycles of various athletic games, including the ancient Olympic Games. The main functions included displaying days and months along with the Babylonian zodiac, tracking lunar months, calculating past and future solar and lunar eclipses through an 18.2 year cycle known as the Saros, and indicating years when major athletic competitions would occur. The mechanism's complexity is unparalleled in antiquity with its intricate gear systems resembling those found in medieval clocks developed over a millennium later. The Antikythera mechanism operates through a sophisticated system of gears that translate rotational motion into various outputs. A hand crank would turn a primary gear wheel, which then set all other gears in motion. This allowed users to track celestial bodies such as the Sun, Moon, and five known planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, by displaying their positions within the zodiac. Recent studies using advanced imaging techniques have revealed inscriptions on the device that provide insight into its operation and purpose. These inscriptions suggest that it could simulate complex astronomical phenomena, including retrograde motions of planets through a system of epicyclic gearing. The Antikythera mechanism stands as a testament to ancient Greek ingenuity in mechanical engineering and astronomy. It reflects an advanced understanding of celestial mechanics that was not replicated until much later in history. The device challenges previous assumptions about technological capabilities in antiquity, suggesting that similar mechanisms may have existed but were lost over time. In modern times, ongoing research continues to uncover details about its construction and functionality. Scholars believe it represents a convergence of Babylonian astronomy with Greek mathematical theories. It had structure, uh, some, some sort of structure that revolved like a merry-go-round. Illustrating how ancient civilizations synthesized knowledge across cultures. The National Archaeological Museum in Athens currently houses the Antikythera mechanism, which continues to serve as a focal point for research on ancient technology. Its discovery has not only rewritten aspects of technological history, but also provided profound insights into how ancient peoples conceptualized their universe. A machine governed by predictable laws, much like our current scientific understanding. The Nanjing Belt In 1952, during excavations for a middle school sports field in Ying City, Jiangsu Province, China, workers made a remarkable discovery an ancient artifact known as the Nanjing Belt. This belt was found alongside the remains of a wealthy individual, identified through inscriptions as General Zhou Cho, who lived during the Jin Dynasty. The initial examination suggested that the belt was primarily composed of copper and silver. However, subsequent analysis revealed the presence of aluminum, an unexpected find as aluminum was not isolated until the early 19th century in Europe. The Nanjing Belt's discovery raises significant questions about ancient Chinese metallurgy. The Jin Dynasty was known for its advanced metalworking techniques, yet the presence of aluminum challenges existing narratives regarding the capabilities of ancient craftsmen. Aluminum does not occur freely in nature. It is typically found in bauxite and requires high temperature processes to extract. The technology necessary for isolating aluminum was not available until much later, leading to speculation about how such an advanced item could have been produced in ancient China. The tomb where the Nanjing belt was found contained approximately 20 metal pieces that were believed to have adorned a now rotted leather belt. Among these pieces, four were identified as being composed of nearly pure aluminum. The implications of this finding are profound, suggesting either an unknown method of aluminum production 
or potential contamination from modern sources. Initial tests conducted by Nanjing University and the Chinese Academy of Sciences confirmed the presence of aluminum. Further tests at Tsinghua University solidified these findings, revealing that while some fragments contained silver alloys, others were predominantly aluminum. This led to intense debates within scientific circles regarding the authenticity of these artifacts. A critical review published by scholars from St. Andrews University examined the metallurgical processes available during the Jin Dynasty. They concluded that while it was theoretically possible to produce small quantities of aluminum through carbon reduction methods, the temperatures required were significantly higher than what could be achieved with contemporary technology. This raised doubts about whether the aluminum components of the Nanjing belt were genuine artifacts from that era, or if they had been introduced later by grave robbers or other means. Several theories have emerged to explain the presence of aluminum in the Nanjing belt. Some researchers propose that ancient Chinese metallurgists may have accidentally discovered methods to isolate aluminum from its ores long before European scientists did. This theory suggests a level of sophistication in ancient Chinese metalwork that has not been fully appreciated. Another possibility is that native aluminum grains were discovered and utilized by Jin Dynasty craftsmen. Reports from 1985 indicated that grains of native aluminum had been found in Guizhou province, raising questions about whether these materials could have been used in crafting items like the Nanjing belt. Skeptics argue that the aluminum fragments could be remnants left behind by modern grave robbers or archaeologists who inadvertently mixed contemporary materials with ancient artifacts. Some suggest that the entire scenario could be a hoax or misinterpretation, possibly stemming from errors in excavation or analysis. The Nanjing Belt remains an enigma within both archaeological and metallurgical studies. Its existence challenges established timelines regarding metal production and raises intriguing questions about ancient technologies. While definitive answers remain elusive, Ongoing research continues to explore this fascinating artifact's origins and implications for our understanding of ancient Chinese craftsmanship. The debate surrounding the Nanjing Belt illustrates how archaeological discoveries can reshape historical narratives and provoke further inquiry into humanity's technological advancements throughout history. Whether it serves as evidence of advanced ancient metallurgy or as a cautionary tale about interpreting artifacts through modern lenses, its story is far from over. The Tamil Bell The Tamil Bell is a captivating artifact that has intrigued historians and archaeologists since its discovery in the 19th century. Encountered by missionary William Colenso in 1836, the bell was found among a group of Maori women in New Zealand who were using it to boil potatoes. Measuring approximately 13 centimeters in length and made of bronze, the bell features inscriptions in an ancient form of Tamil script. Its presence in New Zealand at a time when there was no known trade between Maori and any part of Asia raises significant questions about its origins. Colenso, who was the first European to visit the village where the bell was found, noted its unusual characteristics. The Maori community informed him that the bell had been in their possession for generations, having been discovered among the roots of a tree uprooted during a storm. This claim adds an element of mystery to the artifact, as it suggests that the bell had a long history before Colenso's encounter. The fact that bronze was not available in New Zealand at that time further complicates its narrative, leading to various theories about how it came to be there. One prevalent theory posits that the Tamil bell may have originated from a Muslim merchant ship. Historical records indicate that Tamil traders were active in maritime commerce, navigating routes that extended across the Indian Ocean and into Southeast Asia. Some scholars suggest that the bell could have drifted ashore from an abandoned vessel or been lost by sailors during their travels. The inscription on the bell, which translates to Mohoiden Buk Ship's Bell, has led researchers to speculate that it may have belonged to a ship named Mohideen Baksh, invoking the protection of a revered saint among Muslim merchant communities. Despite these theories, no conclusive evidence supports any single explanation for the bell's presence in New Zealand. Some researchers argue that it could have been part of a larger trading network that included connections between South Asia and Polynesia, 
Although no definitive records exist to substantiate this claim, theories have also emerged suggesting that Spanish sailors marooned in French Polynesia during the 1500s might have brought the bell to New Zealand, or that it could have been dropped off by a Portuguese ship after contact with Tamil traders. The Tamil Bell's inscription has undergone extensive study over the years, initially dated to the 15th or 16th century based on its script style, more recent research has pushed this date back to the 17th or 18th century. This re-evaluation is based on the evolution of Tamil script over time, and insights gained from shipping logs indicating that many vessels were named after saints like Mohideen Baksh during this period. This suggests that rather than being an owner's name, the inscription might denote the ship itself. The artifact's enigmatic nature has captured public curiosity and scholarly attention alike. After Colenso's death in 1899, he bequeathed the bell to what is now known as Te Papa Tongarewa, the Museum of New Zealand, where it remains today. Its unknown provenance continues to fuel interest and speculation about ancient maritime interactions and trade routes. In 1975, after stories about the Tamil Bell were published in regional newspapers in Tamil Nadu, India, several families claimed descent from merchants who may have owned a ship named Mohideen Baksh. However, these claims remain unverified, and no concrete evidence links them to the bell's history. The Tamil Bell serves as a reminder of humanity's complex history of exploration and trade. It symbolizes how artifacts can transcend cultural boundaries and challenge our understanding of historical timelines. While definitive answers about its origins remain elusive, Ongoing research continues to explore its significance within broader narratives of ancient maritime activity. The Tamil Bell encapsulates a rich tapestry of cultural exchange and mystery. Its discovery highlights not only the interconnectedness of ancient civilizations, but also raises important questions about how artifacts travel across time and space, leaving behind stories waiting to be uncovered. Honorable Mention, Dorchester Pot, the Dorchester Pot, discovered in 1851 in Dorchester, Massachusetts, is a fascinating artifact that has sparked considerable debate and speculation regarding its origins and implications. This bell-shaped vessel, found embedded in solid rock during construction work, is claimed to be over 100,000 years old and features representations of extinct plant species. Its discovery has led to various interpretations, particularly within the realms of fringe archaeology and creationist theories. The pot was unearthed when workers used explosives to break up rock at Meeting House Hill. Following the explosion, two pieces of the pot were recovered from the debris. The location of these fragments suggested that the pot had been blasted from a layer of solid pudding stone, part of the Roxbury conglomerate, approximately 10 to 15 feet below the surface. The Roxbury conglomerate itself is dated to the Ediacaran period, between 570 and 593 million years ago, which adds an intriguing layer to the artifact's narrative. Described as approximately 4.5 inches high and 6.5 inches in diameter at the base, the Dorchester pot is said to be made of a metal resembling a zinc-silver alloy. Its exterior features intricate designs, including six floral figures inlaid with pure silver and a vine or wreath motif around its lower part. The craftsmanship suggests a level of artistry that raises questions about its creators and their technological capabilities. Local newspapers first reported on the Dorchester pot, and in 1852, the Scientific American published an article about it. The article described the object as a relic from a bygone age prompting speculation about its purpose and origin. Some fringe theorists have posited that it serves as evidence of advanced prehistoric civilizations or even extraterrestrial contact. For instance, creationist Michael Cremo has claimed that it indicates the presence of sophisticated metalworkers in North America over 600 million years ago. However, mainstream archaeologists and scientists are skeptical of these claims. They argue that there is no credible evidence supporting the idea that the Dorchester pot is as ancient as suggested or that it was created by an unknown civilization. Many experts identify it as a Victorian-era candlestick holder or pipe holder rather than an ancient artifact. Archaeologists Keith Fitzpatrick Matthews and James Doser have specifically noted that it is difficult to understand 
why anyone would take such reports seriously, given the clear Victorian style associated with the object. Despite its intriguing design and historical context, the Dorchester pot's authenticity remains contentious. Over time, it has passed through various museums but ultimately disappeared from public view, leaving behind only photographs and descriptions. The lack of physical evidence has fueled speculation about its true nature and age. The Dorchester pot is a cautionary tale about interpreting archaeological finds without rigorous scientific validation, even though it captivates those interested in strange artifacts and ancient mysteries. The blending of myth, speculation, and historical inquiry surrounding this object highlights both our fascination with ancient history and the importance of critical analysis in understanding our past. As we uncover the mysteries of these out-of-place artifacts, we are reminded of the vastness and complexity of our ancient past. Each discovery opens the door to a deeper understanding of history. Thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed exploring these ancient mysteries, don't forget to subscribe and like.